Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock podcast. For more information, visit us at churchak.org, download our Church on the Rock AK app, or like us on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. You ready? (laughs) All right, then. I don't care if you're ready. We're going anyways. Um, We're going to be jumping into a story today. Um, It's a story uh, that maybe is familiar to you. It's probably one of um, two or three stories, unfortunately, that the life of David is most associated with. And we're going to be looking at the story of David and Bathsheba. And um, I want to give this caveat on the front end here. For some of you in this room, if you have experienced um, unfaithfulness in marriage relationships, um, if you've experienced broken trust in those ways, um, I want you to know this. God's desire, his intention, is not just to bring up painful moments from the past. His interest is not in triggering you. His interest is that you would discover something about him in this process. So whether you were the offender or whether you were offended, God has something to say through this narrative that I think is really, really important for us. And it's actually really hopeful. Now, I say that, and in the same turn, I have experienced some things over the past several years in relationship with people in ministry, dear friends of mine, people I deeply love, who have walked out this painful journey. And there are days when I find myself thinking, is there anyone left who will do the right thing over the long haul? Right? Uh, Like, it seems like growing up as a kid, there used to be a day. Maybe we just didn't have as much social media, and that's why I didn't know about it. I don't know what the deal really is. I think people have always been people. But the, the reality is that it seems like in recent years, every other week, there is some new catastrophe and moral failure in leadership. And I've told our team from time to time, listen, I think if you just kept your nose clean and your head screwed on straight, that we would probably do great in the future just by not falling into some of the same traps. And there are days for myself that I find myself wondering, when's the other shoe going to drop? When's the next story going to come out? Anybody else feel that way? Okay, good. Then I'll just preach this sermon to me. Um, I think I'm really going to enjoy it a second time here um, today also. Uh, So it's a heavy topic. Uh, but God's got good intentions for you and I. The other thing I want you to know is that failure isn't final, but its effects are far-reaching. And that's what we're going to discover in the story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, My title today is The Devil's in the Details. If you've got a Bible, I would encourage you to get it out. If you don't own a Bible, we have Bibles back there. You can take one. It's yours forever. If you have 10 of them at home already, please bring nine of them back. That'd be awesome, unless you're like going to your neighbors and handing them out or something. But um, they are there, they're for you. But I would encourage you, have a Bible out, be ready to read along, because context matters when it comes to the biblical text, all right? And then if you got a pen and a notepad, be taking notes, because you're going to retain a whole lot more. That's my free plug once again this week. All right, are you ready now? Yeah. We're going the wrong direction. Are you ready now? Yeah. Listen, I, I was at Men's Summit um, this weekend, uh, man, we got a bunch of screwed up men. I was up every night till like 1230 praying with people. It was just a hot mess. Um, and, uh, but the, the thing is, the thing is, um, I need you to help me preach today. All right. So Mike Michaud, I know you're from, you know, you're a New Englander and you guys don't shout, but uh, amen every now and then, you know, would be great. Landon, anybody. Okay. Thanks. All right. I heard that. I saw your lips move. I don't know if you said anything. Okay. Here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to spend the bulk of our time right here in 11 and 12 in 2 Samuel. The devil's in the details. Listen to the details. In the spring of the year, how many of you are so excited spring's coming? I just want to pause there for a moment and worship. Um, uh, oh, also, it is spring right now, so there's that. Yep. In the spring of the year, when kings 
normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. There's a couple little details here that I want to pause and take a look at real quickly. The first one is this, that the kings would normally go out to war with their people. It was important that the king was out there, that the leader was present with you, that he was part of what was going on. And on the one hand, if I was David, I would think we've reached the place that I've wanted to arrive, a place of affluence, a place of security. I've I've raised up the right team. I've got the right people on the right seats on the bus, and I don't even need to go out to war anymore. I got Joab, and by the way, they're winning the battles without David there. And so on the one hand, if I was a leader, I could think, man, that's a win. That's a success. I don't even have to be present in order for victory to be accomplished. Joab's got this. But David is supposed to be out there, and he isn't. He's made a decision in this moment to stay back because the power they have now, the affluence and the authority he has now, have actually afforded him the opportunity to not have to engage. It goes on. Devil's in the details. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest. You know how it is when you're king. <laughs> Just grabbing a nap in the middle of the day, a cup of warm milk. David's getting up late afternoon after his afternoon nap because he's not out on the battlefield with his men. Wouldn't it be nice? David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath, which is where she got the name Bathsheba. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. It's totally false. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of things here because I've heard people reference before, like, what was she thinking? She was thinking that she was doing what almost everyone did in the culture. In fact, if you spent any time in Middle Eastern cultures or even Eastern cultures, like, you would realize that the reason they have a flat roof is the roof becomes another room in the house, and the reason you would put water up there is because it would be warm for bathing later in the day. It is not uncommon. She's doing exactly what would be expected to be done. David is looking around in places where he knows what's going on during that part of the day. She's simply doing probably what she did every single day. That's the first thing I want to identify here. And David sees her over there on the roof. And here's how I would say it. This is just something to consider. Affluence and authority are often the fertile soil for apathy and abuse. That when I can afford to do whatever I want to do, my tendency is to become lazy in the areas that really matter. I begin to let all kinds of disciplines go in my life because I don't have to implement them anymore in order to make it by. And this is where David is at. David can do whatever he wants to do. He is the king, and he has authority and power. And frequently, absolute authority absolutely leads to corruption. And so David is scanning out over the rooftops, and he's got a life of leisure and affluence, and now he has ceased doing the things that he's supposed to be doing. He's napping during the day, and all he has to do is make the phone call, and he can have whatever he wants. So David sees her bathing on the roof over there, And it goes on to describe the next event. He says, he sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. I want to highlight something here. There are a couple of things that you need to know. One, um, because of proximity to the palace, how near she was to the palace, David already knew who it was. In fact, what the text is actually identifying is that David is now for the first time seeing her with new eyes. You'll you'll discover why, because there's a couple of characters identified in the story. If we were to look at the cast of characters, often we think about this story as the story of David and Bathsheba. 
but it isn't the story of David and Bathsheba. There are a bunch of other characters in the story that actually cause David to respond in the way that he does. And it's identified right here. They, they come back to David, and they're like, David, you know who this is. This is Bathsheba. She's the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, and, and the daughter of Elam. The, you know who these people are, David. In fact, David does know who these people are, because in 2 Samuel chapter 23, we're given a list of names that include David's mighty men. These are men who were with David in the wilderness, fighting alongside of him, seeing victories won. These are the people David trusted more than anyone else on the planet, and they have been with him through thick and thin. Here's the list. Other members of David's, 30 mighty men included, Ashal, Joab's brother, Elam, son of Ahithophel, of Gilo and Uriah the Hittite, there were 37 in all. David, you know who this is. In fact, most scholars believe David is around 50 years old at this time, which, by the way, isn't old. I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> David's around 50 years old, and Bathsheba is somewhere around 20. It's well within reason. As a little girl, she was hearing stories about David from her dad and from her grandfather. It's well within reason that she viewed David as the mighty warrior he was, a man after God's own heart, a spiritual leader in the nation of Israel. And now she's married to a man named Uriah. And Uriah wasn't even a Jew, but he came into and under the God of Israel because of David's influence in his life. This cast of characters is more than David and Bathsheba. It's David and Bathsheba and Uriah and Alam. In fact, if you were to look at it, the story actually gets even more horrific because also Elam's father, Bathsheba's grandfather, is a guy named Ahithophel. And Ahithophel is identified in the text in the list of mighty men because he is the counselor to the king. He is the king's advisor. First Chronicles 27.33 just identifies that Ahithophel was the royal advisor to the king, is what it says. So here we have in the cast of characters that Elam and Uriah, David's mighty men, and we have Ahithophel, the advisor to the king, the king's counselor, and we have Bathsheba and David. And now you begin to understand why David doesn't want anyone to find out what he's about to do. In the past, David had been a guy who would quickly admit his wrongdoing. He would quickly repent. But in this particular case, David goes on a mission to keep it secret. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4. You would think that this would give David pause when they come back and say, David, you know who this woman is. This is... Bathsheba, she's the wife of Uriah, one of your mighty men. She's the daughter of Elam, one of your mighty men. She's the granddaughter of Ahithophel, your counselor. David, you know who this woman is. And you would think in that moment, David would be like, oh, never mind. But that's not what happens. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Consider this. I'll say it again, I'll say it in this way. Wealth and power are often the seedbed of apathy and abuse in our lives. Maybe you're thinking, good thing I'm not wealthy. I ain't got no power. Yes, you do, and yes, you are. There are people that you have influence over. There are people who are in your realm of authority and the question is, when you're at that place where you can get away with being lazy, you can afford to not have certain disciplines in your life, how will you handle that power and authority? That's the real question for you and I. Amen? Yes. Good. I'm just going to amen myself. It's fine. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing. There's a um, progression for David. David didn't end up here overnight. While mistakes may be made in a moment, there's a series of events, a sequence of events that gets us from here to there. I refer to them as the little foxes. 
I don't just refer to them as the little foxes. That's actually what the Song of Songs refers to them as. If you want a great read with your kids, man, read through the Song of Solomon, Song of Songs with your children from the time they're about five. You will never have to have the birds and the bees talk. It'll all be taken care of. Um, don't do that. It's a terrible idea. Um, but here's what I want you to know. Song of Songs is actually a love story. And, and don't make it weird. It's not a love story about us and Jesus, because it gets really weird if that's the kind of love story it is. I actually think God put it in the scriptures as a real example of what human love and romance is supposed to look like when it's brought under the authority of God. And so as you read through the narrative, you see this beautiful story unfold, and it's full of sexuality, and it's full of love and adoration and affection, but there are a few times, because there are several characters in the story, there's the woman, and there's her beloved, and then there's um, the sisters or the daughters of Jerusalem, and then there's his friends, and there's all this dialogue going on, and at one point, her friends say to her, do not awaken or arouse love until the time is right. You know why? Because love aroused leads to lust. So there are certain things you should avoid until the moment's right because they have a propensity naturally and by God's design to take you from here to there. So don't awaken those things just yet. And then they give her this advice in the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 15. They say, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. Look, look, it's almost time for the grapes to show up. And what we want is a great harvest of grapes. And there's someone else who knows that the harvest is about to happen. And it's all of the little foxes. And when you think about a little fox coming into a massive vineyard, I mean, think about the pictures you've seen before, the size of vineyards. And a little fox, what's it really going to do? But all it has to do is eat at the root of one vine to destroy an entire row. And, and here's what they're identifying. There are little things making their way into your relationship that will do massive damage if left unattended. Small things matter. And here's what I know about the enemy of your soul and my soul. His interest is not in getting you to fail in some small way. His interest is getting you to fail in some small way and then bringing complete destruction in your life as a result of those small failures. Don't, don't fool yourself. Don't, don't, don't fool yourself. Like, if I just watch a few more of these reels, then I'll get this out of my system. If I just give in in this area, if I just read this article, if I just fantasize about this person a little bit longer, that'll be out of the way. It's not out of the way. It's spoiling the vineyard of love. It's actually intended to bring complete and total destruction in your life, and in the life of everyone around you. Don't fool yourself. The little things matter much more than you could possibly imagine in this moment right here and right now. In fact, in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, there's a passage that we don't really like all that much. Um, and I refer to it as the um, law of sowing and reaping or cause and effect. And here's what it says. Do not be deceived. God usually isn't mocked. Most of the time, God is, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. There's a principle of sowing and reaping at work in our lives. It actually has very little to do with forgiveness or grace or mercy from God because all of those things are available and yet the law of sowing and reaping will still be in effect. And it's crazy. You'll watch people who will sow in this field of destruction for years and years and years and then want to reap over here in this field of spiritual blessing. And yet you will reap from the field that you sow in. It, it's something I think we don't really like much. I don't know about you. I mean, I know I don't like it. Like, I, I tend to think that if I could sow into the field of eating Krispy Kreme donuts every night and watching Netflix, that I could somehow reap from the field of being fit and, you know, winning the next Ironman competition. But it's most likely not going to happen. I will reap from the field that I'm sowing in. It's true in spiritual life. It's true in physical life. The law of cause and effect. 
Now, here's what happens. Um, David goes into cover-up mode. In fact, he goes into extreme cover-up mode. He figures um, if Bathsheba is pregnant, then maybe I could get Uriah to come back in enough time where it's not obvious. You know, they weren't doing ultrasounds or anything. And maybe if I could get Uriah to come back and do a little bit of R&R at home, that he and Bathsheba would get together and, you know, and, and so, and then he would think that this child is his child. And so he sends to the military, he says, Joab, can you send Uriah the Hittite back? And Uriah comes back. He doesn't know why he's being called back, but when he gets back, David's like, no, go home and spend some quality time with your wife. And Uriah's like, no way. Like, my men are out on the battlefield right now. I mean, I know you're the king and all. You should be out there with us, but you can do what you want. But if I'm back here, I am not going to enjoy things that my men aren't able to enjoy right now. I will wait until you send me back out to the field. And he sleeps outside on the porch at his own house. Like, he's a man of high integrity, high character, which, by the way, he probably picked up and learned from David back in the day. And David does everything in his power to get Uriah to be a part of his plan. When it's obvious that that is not going to happen, he sends him back out to the battlefield, and he tells Joab, here's what I want you to do. When you're up at the front lines and the battle is raging, I want you to back away from Joab. And he effectively murders him with someone else's sword. Now, God loves David, and he's not going to let this slide. In fact, when someone confronts you in your life, you should be really grateful for it. If you have truth tellers in your life, you should be really grateful for them. Because being told the truth is one of the most important things for you and I. And there are plenty of people who might be afraid of your influence or your power or whatever, but you need to find people who will speak truth to you. And Nathan is one of those people in the life of David. And so Nathan shows up at the palace. David, we need to chat. And David's like, that's perfect. Um, I'm getting ready to take a nap. And so, so Nathan's like, well, let me tell you a bedtime story. Here's your milk. Snuggle all in. I got a story for you, David. And here's the story he tells David. He says, David, there are two men, a rich man and a poor man, a man with power and a man without power. And the rich man has lots and lots of sheep and cattle and all kinds of things. And the poor man only has one little lamb that he has raised from birth. It's like part of the family. I mean, the story's a little bit weird, like the lamb eats off of the guy's plate and drinks out of his cup. I mean, like, but he's just saying his children love it. It's part of the family in this man's household. The rich man has lots of sheep and lots of cattle. And one day, a bunch of friends show up at the rich man's house, and they want to have dinner. And instead of killing one of his sheep for dinner, he goes and takes the poor man's one lamb and kills it. And of course, David is a man who's after God's own heart. He knows what justice is, and he knows what injustice is. And so David is like, let me at him. Like, that is so wrong on so many levels. Why would you go and take something so precious to someone else when you have everything? And Nathan says to David, you're that man. Ooh. And Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and kingdoms and Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all of Israel. I've often wondered if I could see the future fruit of my sinful actions, would I alter my current course? What if you could see the outcomes of these 
seemingly small indiscretions now or these catastrophic things? What if you could see the future outcomes? Would it alter your course at all? And I would love to think that it would, and yet the reality is I actually can see them. I can see them in the life of David. I can see them in the life of Noah. I could see them in the lives of numbers of people listed in the scriptures. It might not be the exact same details, but it's the exact same story over and over and over and over and over, and you get the idea again. I can see the future fruit of my current actions. And the question is, will we allow it to alter our course? David, if he had any idea, if he had been able to wrap his head around the actual outcomes, I think he never would have made the decision he made. In fact, it's exactly what he says. He would never have made the decision. Now, here's what happens. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I know you're probably thinking, like, David, you sinned against a whole bunch of people. But when it comes to the issue of sin... You actually only sin against God. We offend one another. We wound one another. But God is the only perfect and sovereign being in all of the universe. He is the only faultless being. He's the only one who can give the law. And it's his law. It's his direction that we actually break. And David recognizes, I've sinned against God. That's my real offense. That's what I've done. And Nathan replied, duh. No, (laughs) Nathan replied, yes. But the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. Wait, that was on the table? Like, it was within the realm of possibility. It's what Nathan identifies here, that God was going to kill David for this sin. But David does what David has done. He repents in this moment. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. I don't want to just like glance over this because there's a bunch of questions. Anybody else have questions? Like, I don't think the kid did anything. Like, why would God kill the child? Like, David's the one responsible for this action. I just want to remind you of something that we forget in Western culture in particular, but as humans in general, we forget far too quickly. I want you to imagine the scene, right? The child is born and dies then. Like in infancy, the child dies. And what do we believe happens when this child dies? It's in eternity with the sovereign God of all the universe. And so imagine you're in paradise in an instant, and there ain't nobody up there who's saying, man, I feel so gypped on not getting to live on that ball of dirt with all the chaos and the corruption for 75 years. Right From God's vantage point and from the child's vantage point, this instant in that moment is ushered into eternity and paradise. Right, it, it, We get wrapped around the axle about the wrong things. You know who's suffering the consequences? David and Bathsheba. Because there's no way to escape the loss that they're experiencing and the guilt that David is feeling in that moment. But that child... See ya, right? It's important to understand because we often place a premium on this brief breath and blink that we have on this planet, and this is not what you were created for. You were created for eternity with God. All right, I want to skip the hard parts. Here's what I've discovered, though, and this is a real challenge for us. Repentance does not always eliminate consequence. We would love for it to. I repented. Why do I still have consequences? But repentance does not always eliminate consequences. There are some consequences that are eliminated when we repent. In particular, eternal consequences, but there are also other temporary or temporal consequences. But don't live with the assumption that just because you repented, there are no consequences. God will not be mocked. You will still reap from the field in which you have sown. And if David had seen this graph I'm about to show you, this image I'm about to show you, I can guarantee you that he would have never headed down the road that he did. In fact, 
as a result of David's sin, not only will this child die, but his own son Ammon will rape his daughter Tamar. And the scriptures identify, it's one chapter later, but he's like, dad did that, I have power, I can do this. I am in charge. I have affluence and I have authority and I'm going to abuse my power. I watched my dad abuse his power and so Ammon will rape Tamar. And Absalom, David's other son, will be furious about this, more specifically furious that his father did nothing about it, probably in part because of David's own guilt and his own shame. And so Absalom will then kill Ammon and now David has lost two sons and a daughter has been raped. And once Absalom kills Ammon, now Absalom is on the run, and Absalom and David's relationship is never fully repaired, and Absalom will ultimately rebel against his father and steal the throne and the kingdom from him for a season, and ultimately David will lose three sons and have a daughter raped as a result of that sin in his life. Had he known all of that, he would never have made the decision. But here's the problem you don't know all of the impacts of your decisions either. That's why God invites you to trust him because sin always gives birth to death in our lives. And the little things matter more than you could possibly imagine right now. Told you it's heavy, huh? Which brings me to trust and trust fall. I think David would have loved to have had trust rebuilt with his sons. In fact, David's repentance is recorded for us in Psalm 51. It's a beautiful psalm. In fact, if you were to look in your Bible, Psalm 51, the header says, For the choir director, a psalm of David regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And his prayer is this, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out my stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize that my rebellion, it haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. Verse 7, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back the joy again. You have broken me, now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit in me. I mean, David's repentance is authentic, and it's genuine. And yet, here's what I have discovered over the years. That repentance, repentance is always met with the grace and the mercy of God. It's always met with the grace and the mercy of God. The moment you or I turn our affection and our attention that we declare our repentance towards the Lord, the Lord immediately lets you know, I got you. Genuine repentance is always met with the mercy of God, but repentance alone does not rebuild trust. Did you hear me? Repentance alone does not rebuild trust when it has been broken. Years ago, I was talking with my father-in-law, and he was describing how trust is built. Because trust is built, not given. Granted, you and I could choose to trust one another. In fact, often you do that when you attend a church, right? You, you may not know the person who's preaching or pastoring all that well, but you're making a choice to trust them. But the reality is that the trust that matters will actually be built over time. It's the only way you build trust is faithfulness over time. That's how real trust is built in relationships. And he described trust in this way. He's like, trust is a gift I give you. I give you the ability to trust me through my faithfulness over time. And each time I give you a reason to trust me, it's like I put a jelly bean in your pocket. I'm going to drop a jelly bean in, another jelly bean in, and eventually your pocket is full of jelly beans. You're, you're full of trust. And what that means is that sometimes you could question, like, what was really going on? What were you doing? And I'm going to tell you what was going on and what I was doing. And I might spend a little bit of that trust capital in order for you to say, okay, I believe you because of faithfulness over time, I can trust you. But in an event, like what happens with David, or an unfaithfulness in a relationship or moral failure in leadership, what happens in that moment is I have effectively 
pushed the person over and knocked all the jelly beans out of their pocket. And what I want is to repent, and then you pick them all up and put them back in your pocket, but that's not how trust works. What I have to do is the same thing I did before. By faithfulness over time, I have to rebuild trust with you. Trust is actually the gift I give you the ability to trust me. And people get frustrated. Well, I repented. God's forgiven me. He trusts me. Actually, you don't know if he trusts you or not. He knows what the decisions you're going to make in the future. God doesn't have to have blind faith or blind trust. He knows all things. But in relationships, you only build trust in one way, faithfulness over time, and you only regain real trust in one way, faithfulness over time. And if you don't want to put in the time and the faithfulness, then do not expect to be trusted. Mm, That's a good word, Pastor. I know it's so hard, but it's so good. Like it resonates, right? And here's the other thing, because I've had this in relationships before, where I feel like I've been trying to put jelly beans in the pocket, jelly beans in the pocket. I'm like dumping jelly beans in the pocket. And I finally have to sit down with someone who refuses to trust me. And I have to say, is there a reason? Is there something I'm missing? Is there something I've done? Because if there isn't, I've been trying to make deposits and your bank is closed every single time. And so you got to decide if you're going to trust me or not, right? There's that side of it also. But if someone's making the investments, I also have to decide if I'm willing to allow them to make the deposit so that we can rebuild trust in our relationship. It goes both ways, but don't fool yourself that just because you were sorry, they should trust you again. That isn't how trust works. They could forgive you and not trust you yet. And if you're willing to put in the time, faithfulness over time is how trust is built. In fact, in some of David's relationships, he will never regain trust again. He won't with Absalom. They're reconciled for a moment because he's tricked into reconciling. But when all's said and done, Absalom will rebel against him. In fact, it was never rebuilt with Ahithophel, Bathsheba's grandfather. I mean, his daughter's now the daughter of, or the wife of the king. I mean, they're going to have a son named Solomon who's going to be the most brilliant man, the wisest man to ever live. But Ahithophel, when the time comes, he will side with Absalom and abandon David because trust was never rebuilt in that relationship. Repentance alone does not rebuild trust, but faithfulness over time may. It could. It can. And you and I have to own that. Now, here's the crazy thing. Remember the story of Peter and his denying Jesus? Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to tell you in advance. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter's like, Jesus, clearly you don't know me. Right? I would never do that, Lord. It's not going to happen. I love you. I would, I would go to death for you. And then it happens. And Peter is just like, it just it hits him like a ton of bricks in that moment. Like, nope, I did it. And Peter doesn't know what to do. He just knows he's not worthy to be serving the Lord anymore because of what he's done. And so he and a group of his fishing buddies get together and are like, well, we know how to fish. Let's go do that. Just to be clear, the same thing happens when Jesus meets them the first time. They actually don't know how to fish all that well, apparently, (laughs) because they're catching no fish. And this guy's standing on the beach, and and he says, put the net on the other side, put the net on the other side, and they catch a bunch of fish. Apparently, the only time they can catch fish is when Jesus is there performing miracles. That's how bad a fisherman they were. But in that moment, Peter's like, that's Jesus on the beach, an impulsive Peter, right? There's some reconciliation that needs to happen between him and Jesus, and he just dives in the water. My guess is that they probably got to the shore around the same time, but, you know, Peter's like, but I jumped in the water, you know. But he wants to get there before everyone else because the resurrected Lord is there, and he needs to talk to Jesus because he's he's done wrong. He gets on the beach, and Jesus doesn't even really give him a chance to explain anything, kind of like the prodigal son, and Jesus just asks him a question. Peter, do you love me? Oh, Jesus, I'm so glad you asked that question. Yes, yes, yes. I know I said I didn't three times, but yes, I do. I've been so heartbroken over my offense. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. And then Jesus asks him the question again. It isn't really about the different words. And Peter's like, you know I love you. 
And then Jesus asks him a third time. And when Jesus asks him the question a third time, we're told that Peter begins to weep. Because I think it dawns on Peter in that moment. I denied the Lord three times. What Jesus is telling me now is, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Do you love me? Oh. Peter, I got you covered. Go feed my sheep. You don't need to sit around and wallow in self-pity anymore, and you sure are terrible fishermen. So, like, get back to what I called you to do. You could be disqualified from a particular role, but the moment that genuine repentance happens, get up, dust yourself off, and get back to joining Jesus in what he's doing in the world. You don't have to stop serving in God's kingdom, but you may be limited in your relationships because of broken trust. Get up and get to work at both. Get up and begin exhibiting faithfulness over time and rebuilding trust where you can and start sharing your story, your encounter with Jesus with those around you. And often when I talk with friends who have just found themselves in terrible situations that they've gotten themselves into, granted, but they find themselves in terrible situations. Often what they're wondering is, why can't I have my position back? Well, because that position requires trust, and trust is only built through faithfulness over time. But positionally with your father, go feed his sheep. Get back to work. Don't sit around wallowing in self-pity, thinking that if you're sorry enough, long enough, God will love you enough to let you get back to joining him and what he's doing in the world. Go feed my sheep is what he tells Peter. Like once repentance has happened and forgiveness is extended, you have a purpose. And wallowing in self-pity will not accomplish it. And I have a responsibility to those that I've offended to begin the long journey of rebuilding trust in that relationship. You stand with me. As I've talked with um, dear friends of mine, people who God has used in extraordinary ways, who found themselves in a moment caught up in something that they never would have imagined they would be caught up in. I I have a lot of friends who I think are a lot like David. They repent quickly. They love Jesus. They're going to run after God with all they have and have found themselves in situations where they have failed miserably. And I'll tell you exactly what they would say to you. I'll tell you what they've told me. That I believed for years there was a chasm between my fantasy life and real life. I believed I was managing these little foxes in my life. I believed I was managing these things in my life relationally with other people, these relationships. And what I discovered over time is that there was no chasm at all between my fantasy life, the little foxes, and my real life. And when the moment presented itself, I had already been set up for seduction. And it was a step not a leap. And what I know for certain is that's true of you and it's true of me. And there are things that are being entertained in this room, relationships that are being entertained in this room, behavior that is corruption and deception that's being entertained in this room. And today the Holy Spirit is giving you warning. It is not a small thing. And your enemy's goal is your total destruction. That small indiscretion, don't pretend that it's small because by pretending that it's small, you will allow it to grow. And he wants to set you on a course where the fruit that you harvest will be from the field of the Spirit and not the flesh. So I'm going to invite our prayer ministry teams to come. They're going to be available on both sides. I'm going to close with a word of prayer, and you're going to be dismissed after that. But my prayer is this, for you and for me, because sometimes I need the Lord to show me. I'm just like looking out over the vineyard, and I'm not even looking down the rows to see what's running down them. And sometimes I just need the Lord to show me what's in my own heart, right? 
But often for most of us, it's like, oh no, I found 15 foxes already. And the question is, will you allow them to be destroyed so that you could flourish and your relationships could live? And so Jesus, my heart's cry because I'm so tired of seeing destruction come in marriages and parent and child relationships and friendships and leadership. And I know you've seen it for generation after generation, but you have a pathway forward. And while we may not know the details of destruction in our own lives, we can certainly know that destruction is the goal of the enemy. And so would you open up our eyes? Would you give us hearts that are transparent? And would you invite us to step fully into the light so we could fully experience life in you? And would you set us free from the future fruit of sinful decisions? And may we model for a generation and experience for ourselves the good life of the sovereign God. I pray your protection over your sons and your daughters. And I pray for your persistent invitation to move towards you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Prayer ministry teams are here. Don't pass up the opportunity. Church in the Rock, love you. Be praying for us while we're in Peru. Grace, peace to you. We'll see you soon. Thank you for listening. For more of our podcasts and to discover how you can connect, visit us at churchak.org or download our Church on the Rock AK app from either iTunes or Google Play.